Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. In this week's video, we are going to be covering burn care, treatment, and assessment. So I figured this week we'd take a break from the product reviews. I know I've been doing a lot of those recently and mainly that's because they're just super easy to do. I just talked about what's in front of me. Um, but I really want to make sure we're still providing you know, a bunch of different topics on this channel. So this week I wanna cover another first aid topic which has been requested a lot and that is burn care. So before we can start with kind of how to care for burns, we need to do a quick anatomy lesson and then we'll go into assessment of burns and classifications. And then finally, we'll go into treatment and kind of what to do with this type of injury. So for starters, we need to go over skin anatomy because after all, burns are predominantly gonna to happen to our skin, which is the protective layer that lines your entire body. I don't need to tell you guys that. But your skin has a couple different layers and it is actually classified as an organ and is the largest organ on your body. So fun trivia fact for you today. So your skin has a couple different layers, like I just said. You have your epidermis, which is the top layer, and that just has a bunch of small layers of skin. It's very, very thin. Uh, it is thicker on certain parts of your body, like the heel of your foot, palm of your hand, anywhere you've got calluses. But in general, it's very, very thin and it's not too tough. Then you have your dermis, which is the layer just under your epidermis. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes of your skin organ. This has all your glands. It's got your hair follicles in it. Um, so it's got your like sweat and oil glands in there. And that's about 10 times thicker than your epidermis. And then below that, you have your subcutaneous layer. Now your subcutaneous layer is mainly vasculature and fat, so adipose tissue. And those are your three main layers. Now beneath your subcutaneous layer, you do have a layer of muscle, which I don't need to explain to you guys what muscle does. All right, so the reason we care about the layers of the skin and what's in each layer is because your burn classifications are actually dependent on what layer of skin is affected. Now, your burn classifications used to go by your first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree, with fourth degree being the most serious and first degree being not as serious. They've since kind of moved away from that terminology and they're going to more plain language so it's easier to understand and easier to communicate what you mean. So what used to be your first degree is now called your superficial, your second degree is partial thickness, your third degree is your full thickness, and your fourth degree is full thickness with deep tissue involvement. So I'm gonna go through each one of those and kind of tell you what the signs and symptoms are and how to kind of classify those. So your superficial burns are going to be your sunburns or your really light uh, thermal burns from maybe steam uh, from the dishwasher or something like that. And these are really not serious burns. Just the epidermis is affected in your superficial burns and generally these will heal within a couple days. Superficial burns rarely require emergency treatment and it's generally something that's just gonna hurt for a while and it's gonna get better. Now your second degree or your partial thickness burns are going to be a little bit more serious and this is where kind of emergency medical services come into it, potential hospital visits, etc. So your partial thickness burns are going to affect the epidermis and the dermis. And these have a wide range of seriousness between them because your dermis is so thick. So a partial thickness might just go a little bit into the dermis or it might go through almost the entire thing. So your hallmarks of a partial thickness burn are going to be blister formation. You might also have a glistening wound bed and it of course is going to be very painful for the patient. So your full thickness burns or what used to be known as third degree burns are very serious and these are going to affect all the layers of your tissue. So that's going to be your epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. These are generally classified by either white or charred skin. Uh, it's also going to be pain adjacent to the wound. Oftentimes the center of a full thickness burn will not hurt the patient because they have no more nerve endings there. However, they have various levels of second and first degree burns surrounding that. So it will be very painful, kind of in a target pattern around the wound. The skin might also look fairly leathery. So look for all of these to classify your full thickness burns. Finally, you have your full thickness burns with deep tissue involvement. I don't need to tell you these are the most serious and these are going to be burns that go all the way down to the muscle and sometimes the bone. These are gonna be classified by all the same things as your full thickness, except you might see cavitation down to these sites 
and severely burned skin over them. Now that I've told you guys all of that and how to classify these burns, I'm gonna tell you that burns are not classified in the pre-hospital setting very accurately. So generally what we wanna determine, is this a superficial burn or is this a deep burn? And that's gonna be what we're gonna go off of. All right, so now that we talked about kind of how to identify these burns and how to recognize the different thicknesses, we need to talk about the actual assessment of the patient. With burns, they look really bad. It's our kind of human instinct to go right to that injury and start treating the burn, but we can't forget that there might be other stuff going on first. The burn is not going to kill somebody acutely. Uh, it's not something that we're worried about right away. It is very serious and we need to address it, but there are a couple other things we need to hit first. First and foremost, we have to go through the ABCs of the patient, so airway, breathing, and circulation. Are they able to transfer air from their lungs to the air around us? Are they actually breathing, and do they have a pulse? If there's a no to any of those, we have to stop and treat those before we do anything with the burn. The second thing we need to look for is other trauma. Generally, burns are accompanied by other injuries. People will jump from their house to avoid being burned, They'll fall downstairs, you know, firefighters, I've known a lot of them, I am one, they're not gentle when they're getting somebody out of the house. Uh, so they may have been injured just getting rescued from that house. So we have to make sure that we're looking for other injuries. The other time injuries are very prevalent in burns is going to be your explosions. We just have to be really careful with these patients and make sure we're treating injuries adequately. So moving on to the assessment of the burn itself. When you're assessing somebody's burn, you have to determine what burned them, and that's gonna be important in a little bit. I'll explain that in a second. So we're gonna to have to expose them completely. We need to determine where on their body they're burned and how much of their body is burned. Now, traditionally in EMS, burns have been relayed by percentages. We've had the rule of nines uh, since I was trained in 2012 and even before that, now they're kind of moving to plain language. So the rule of nines was basically divided the body into 9% increments. So you could relate to the physician, hey, this patient's burned on 18% of their you know, left leg or something like that. Now they're moving to plain language. So you can just relay and say, hey, they have burns to their left arm, left leg, and it's all the way around, something like that. And just be very clear in how you're communicating. All right, so there are a couple areas of the body that are more serious if they're burned, and we need to make sure we're looking for these on our assessments. Mainly, we need to make sure that there are no airway burns. So if the patient has soot or ash around the mouth or nose, singed nasal hairs, they have vocal changes, so they're speaking gruffer or differently than they usually do, huge amounts of sputum production and potentially difficulty breathing, all of those should cue us into the potential for an airway burn they're probably going to need an endotracheal tube, which is an advanced airway to keep that airway open for longer. Uh, because like you know, burns swell, and if you have swelling in the airway, you might have an occlusion there, and the patient's gonna go downhill really quickly. The other things we're looking for are going to be burns in the hands or feet. Obviously, we have a lot of dexterity in uh, your hands and feet, and if you have burns over that, you might lose some of that mobility, and it's something that can affect the patient for a long time down the road. Other than that, you have circumferential burns around the chest. So if they have burns all the way around the chest, that, those burns will eventually become fairly leathery and it might make it very hard for them to breathe. In the hospital, they'll have to do escharotomies, which are cuts down the side to help them be able to expand their chest. And then we're also looking for burns in the genitals or joints. So genitals, I don't need to explain why that's serious. Joints, it's the same as your hands. Uh, that will decrease mobility and can affect them for the rest of their lives. So with any of these, we'll talk about the treatments in a little bit and what we're able to do. Generally, these are things to note and make sure that they have the appropriate destination when they're transporting this patient, preferably to a burn center or at least a level one trauma center. Be aware that in burns, you might have other inhalation injuries with asphyxiants. So the byproduct of combustion, you have cyanide, which is super serious. Nothing you can do about that as just a civilian or a layperson, but they do make things called cyano kits, which are antidote kits for cyanide poisoning. We carry them on our ambulance for our fire department or for other burn victims. Then you have CO poisoning. So CO is also very uh, dangerous. You know, with that, it's just going to be recognizing the signs of CO poisoning and going from there. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about today is going to be your actual treatment of burns. 
the first thing you need to do with burns is stop the burning process. If their wound is still hot, you can flush that with some room temperature water. Keep in mind, you do not want this water to be cold and you do not put ice on these patients. Both of those will cause severe vasoconstriction and it will relieve some of their symptoms, but at the price of decreased healing ability down the road. So we never want to make them cold, make that wound cold um, and get that vasoconstriction going. Do not just randomly rinse wounds if the flesh is no longer hot, if the injury happened a while ago, because it's not doing any good and it's opening the door for some other complications we'll talk about in a second. Now, if it's not just a thermal burn, say it's a chemical burn from either a powder or a liquid, we need to get that material off them as fast as we can to stop that burning process. If it's a powder, try to brush as much of the powder off of them as you can Obviously, you need to be safe, so make sure you have appropriate personal protective equipment for this, and really only do it if you're very comfortable in what you're doing and be just super cautious. I can't stress that enough. But if it's powder, try to brush as much as you can off them and then rinse with water. Rinse with a lot of water to get it off. If you just do a little bit, it might just take that uh, material and put it somewhere else on the body and start another burning process. Same with liquid. You just rinse it with as much water as you can, get it off them uh, as quickly and easily as you can, and make sure that that has somewhere to drain where it's not getting on you or other providers. Now, do this with caution. And oftentimes when somebody's working with chemicals, they'll have a sheet that tells you everything about it. Try to find out what that is <clears throat> because sometimes these chemicals can actually interact with water and make the process worse. So be super careful doing this, and I would recommend seeking some expert consultation at that point. If they have any clothes on and it's a chemical burn, get them out of those clothes as fast as you can because there might be uh, chemicals on them. Obviously, jewelry retains heat really well, so if it was a thermal burn, take off as much jewelry as you can, including wedding rings, especially anything constricting. Get that off them because as they start to swell, it might get a lot harder to take them off and they're going to cause more problems down the road. Treatment used to be we'd cover all these wounds with damp, sterile dressings. We're kind of going away from that. We're not soaking dressings, putting them on the wounds. We're just taking dry, sterile dressings that are not going to get into the wounds. So you don't want your really fibrous uh, rolls of gauze or anything like that. They have burn dressings that are specifically made so that they can come out of the wound without causing any issues there. But we want to be really careful in what we're using. There is a special kind of burn dressing that's gaining a lot of popularity in burn care. It's not necessarily new, but we're just discovering some of the great benefits it has. And these are your nanocrystalline silver sheets. Now these are burn dressings that have a silver mesh in the middle, which is uh, really antimicrobial and then it promotes wound healing. So these are used in burn units a lot and in some EMS agencies because they basically let you put something that's antimicrobial on the patient, but you're not actually having to rub a cream or anything like that on them. So it makes it a lot easier for a physician to take the dressing off, assess the wound and reapply it. The only brand I'm actually familiar with there is your Acticote. They have a lot of studies on them and I'll try to leave a link below to buy them but they're a great product, I would highly recommend them. So on your superficial burns, you can kind of put you know, your aloe ointments or your sunburn cream on them, that's fine. But on your partial thickness and full thickness burns, we really want to avoid putting any kind of gel or cream on them, especially not butter, never put butter on a wound. But we don't wanna put anything that we're rubbing into it because it's gonna make it a lot harder for that wound to be assessed when the patient gets to the hospital. If you are in a wilderness setting, say you have a second degree burn with a blister, you can potentially pop the blister and take a lot of antibiotic cream and put it on that wound if it's gonna be a long time till you can get to definitive care. But do that with caution, try to avoid it if you can. And that's really only in the extreme situations in the wilderness. One hallmark of burn care that is oftentimes forgotten by providers is you have to keep the patient warm. It seems really counterintuitive because they were just burned, they were just a victim of extreme heat, but because they have a lot of their cells are destroyed superficially on their skin, your skin is what regulates temperature in the body, plus they have a lot of fluid leaking out of these cells, causing the wound to be wet and then evaporating they are at extreme risk for hypothermia. So you need to make sure you're covering them with as much as you can once you've wrapped the wound and keeping them as warm as possible. 
If you're in an ambulance or a car and you're comfortable, it is too cold for the patient and you need to crank the heat. For the advanced life support providers that watch this channel, I uh, wanna make a couple quick points there. Airway management is still huge for your uh, inhalation injuries, although they are backing off a little bit in the aggressiveness of intubation, and that's just gonna be a judgment call on your part. I'm not gonna go into that too in depth. As far as fluid resuscitation, you know we've all kind of been there, and I was trained to just give them a ton of fluid. I was trained on the Parkland formula, which was uh, four milliliters of fluid multiplied by uh, kilograms of the patient, multiplied by total body surface area burned. And that was how much fluid had to be delivered over a 24 hour period. Now, my first instructor told me, hey, just open two lines wide open. They need as much fluid as possible. And we're really finding that's not the case. If you wanna get really specific on the fluid resuscitation, there is a formula that they came out with that's a little bit more accepted. And that's going to be one milliliter multiplied by kilogram of the patient multiplied by the total body surface area burned, and then divided by eight, and that's going to give you what you need for your first hour of fluid resuscitation for that patient. Otherwise, the recommendation is just to give 500 milliliters pre-hospital, unless there's clinical signs that indicate you should be giving bigger fluid boluses. So if the patient's blood pressure is very low, uh, you have severe signs of that dehydration or hypovolemia, then you're gonna be titrating that fluid up to what your protocols say, up to and including vasopressors. But as a general rule, we're not just flooding the patient with fluid for no reason. Uh, for fluid considerations and what you should be picking, try to stay away from normal saline if you can. If you give too much normal saline in a burn patient or anybody, you're gonna make them pretty acidotic. I think lactate ringers is a better choice, uh, but I completely understand not many people are carrying lactate ringers. Uh, so, you know, use what you can, you know, 500 milliliters of normal saline isn't going to hurt them, but just be cautious with that. And of course, everything I've talked about, defer to your local protocols and your training. This is informational only. So, um, you know, I'm giving you guys this information from what I know, uh, but that's not saying that just because you watch this video, you can go out and treat people. Thanks for watching, guys. If you have any questions about anything I mentioned today, please leave them in the comments down below. Medical care is always changing and evolving, so if I misspoke or you think I forgot something, please let me know. Otherwise, I will see you next week.